I think everybody was here before when I spoke, pretty much, so I'm going to skip all of these slides about me. Other than to remind you that my dad died when I was a senior in high school. He left me nothing except a Volkswagen. I didn't get to college, and I opened a junkyard. I drove a Fisker. It's an electric car. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, I started a junkyard. I later sold out to Ford Motor Company. Um, it wasn't a good fit for them. They lost a quarter billion, sold me the subsidiary back, 33 locations in 19 states. And then I turned it around and sold it and bought and sold and founded a few other companies along the way. So I'm going to skip all of these. Uh, the prior speaker used a term called parapasu, which is in my book, Green Weenies, which is deal terms. We can give this away at the end of the meeting. And I like parapasu because it does impress people, but I never use it relative to bankers. I use it in a lot of other ways. This week I used it with a husband and a wife that were in a consulting assignment that were splitting up and trying to divide assets. And parapasu can be used just about anywhere you want to talk about being equal with another stakeholder, with a partner, well, if you want to do that, fine, but, but just make me pair up a suit. So uh, it's an interesting term, and, and it does throw people for a loop. These are pictures of the books. Uh, I'm going to go pretty fast because I have a lot of slides really packed in, and uh, I'm just hoping I can finish it. But if not, I just won't. <laughs> I'm a real professional speaker, you know. Keys to my success. I don't know how many of these were in the last presentation, but I think a lot of these were not. Since as early as I can remember, I was a voracious reader. I read Wall Street Journal every day. Not cover to cover, but a lot of it. Uh, it helped me with the vocabulary that I didn't get and the terms that I didn't get when I didn't go to college. Um, I'm very, I work really hard, six or seven days a week. I, I tell everybody at this point in my life, I'm 59 years old, I'm trying to cut my work week back to about 55 hours. Uh, when I'm in town, I work six days a week, 12 days an hour a day, and that's 72 hours. And nowadays, if I can work five days a week, 10 hours, 11 hours, go to work about seven-ish and come home about seven-ish, something like that. And you, you do have to be careful that you don't, that the grind is you come to work, you turn the key, you turn on the coffee maker, you turn on the lights, you go to work, and it can, get, and it, it can be hard. It can, and you have to be careful that you don't get caught up in that. And if you don't have the passion, I think everybody here does, but I'm used to speaking at conferences and there's people that have been in business 35 years and they just don't care anymore. And if, you're not, if you don't love what you're doing, you need to move on. You have to develop your strategic and your leadership skills through association participation. I'm a big advocate of being uh, a member of an association, uh, shared and spoke at conventions, a lot of networking, a lot of time in the bar comparing data with other people and learning ideas. <laughs> I don't drink, by the way, so, but you can spend a lot of time in a bar whether you drink or not. And I always tell women, I remember everything. <laughs> training courses. If you're not taking another training course every two months, some kind of training course, how to deal with difficult people, something about accounting, I hire a lot of consultants. I hired a consultant last month to do a third-party study of the uh, competitive salons. There are 72 salons in Tarrant County, and I, I have three locations where we rent spaces to salon stylists. What is that? Oh, salon salons and spas. And I'm opening three more locations, and I want to understand where the competitors are, what they're charging. Mystery shop them. They give you their leases. They tell you what their rates are. They go around and talk to the other tenants. They tell you all the gossip. It's great. It's great. And so I'm a big believer in hiring consultants to help us get things done. I learned financials. I don't have any formal uh, accounting experience, but if you don't know the financials, you have to learn them. And it doesn't mean that you have to be absolutely the best at it. And I remember one time, it was after Ford Motor Company bought my business, and I had to go to Detroit a lot, and I was there, and there was a whole floor of people, and they introduced me to somebody, and, I, and she was had something to do with the accounting for our division. And I said, so you're the chief bean counter. And she looked at me like, oh my God, her eyes could have killed me. And I didn't realize you weren't supposed to call accountants bean counters. <laughs> a year later, I was back at Ford Motor Company, and there was a post-it note hung in her cubicle that said bean counter. 
it was somebody had, was, they were still giving her crap about the guy from Texas. They called her the bean counter. You don't have to understand it all, but you have to understand enough to get by. And I always had perfect credit. The bankers don't want to hear anything about excuses. I never had any money. I was always highly leveraged. I had a high aversion to risk. And this sounds like a contradiction, but in the junkyard business, I don't know if anybody's ever been to a junkyard. And let me explain that means buy cars and sell parts. It doesn't mean scrap metal like selling refrigerator metal and things like that. Most junkyards are small. They're very family-owned uh, uh, businesses, and they tend to be very small. And normally the, the, the owners are first or second generation, and they tend to be kind of crotchety and, uh, and, and not well-educated. It doesn't make them bad people. It just is kind of systemic with the business. But they tend to be very small because they get really angry over the smallest things. And if you're going to get bigger, you're going to have to tolerate some mediocrity. You're going to have to learn that we all have this thing that we're, we're the only one that can do it. Nobody can do it better than us. And by the way, that's probably true. But unfortunately, you can't do everything. And I can remember I was a special expert at Volkswagens because that's what I had. And I remember coming inside one time and saying, Ron, we can't get this car started out in the shop so we can see if the motor's good, so we can you know, inventory it and put it up. We need you to come help us get it started. I said, I'm not coming to the shop and help you start that Volkswagen. I know how to start it, and I know I can come start it. But you guys need to, to do the starting of the engine so that I can run this up front. But as you get bigger and bigger, people do stupid crap. They really do. And the more you get, the more stupid crap you're going to get. And if you can't tolerate some of that, and I know it sounds crazy that you, you've got to have this high version to risk or low version to risk at any given point, and then you've got to tolerate mediocrity, but you're not going to get bigger if you can't tolerate some mediocrity. And obviously you have to get the right, com the right amount. You've got to surround yourself with talent. I was the first guy in the auto salvage business to have a controller. And I didn't know that a, that a controller was really, I thought it was just a title for a glorified bean counter. But I, I, love the, I love it because everybody else had a bookkeeper. And some of them called him a controller. And back then, you could hire a bookkeeper for $35,000. A controller was $65,000. Today, a bookkeeper is fifty, dollars and a controller is a buck and a quarter. And I love it because after I hired the controller, I mean, he, was, he just reeked respect. And he was always delivering the financial statements with a commentary on how we could make them better. And I remember one time, we were trying to roll out this program. We spent $10,000 a month on pallets, wood pallets. I'm sure a lot of you folks have businesses with wood pallets. And we left them at the customer's place. And so we decided that we would put aluminum pallets on the trucks and offload the merchandise, and we outfitted the trucks. And my operations manager complained Week after week in the meeting, I couldn't get the drivers to do the aluminum pallets because they were too heavy and it was going to be a problem and it was going to hurt productivity. And the controller was the one that had come with the idea. We spent $1,000 per aluminum pallet to have aluminum pallets made for 10 trucks. And he, he, looked, he leaned, kind of leaned out across the table and he took his fist and he pounded the table one time and he said, just as soon as we can pay the damn bills with all that with all that attitude you got, I'll let you know. Otherwise, use the pallets. You know, bookkeepers don't talk like that. They don't bring that ring to a meeting. And so you have to surround yourself with people that are smarter and that have skills that you don't have. It's mostly about marketing. I hate to say it. Bad products, we all know a bad product that we bought just because of some advertising. And they do well. Bad products do well because of good advertising. You've got to have good marketing and good advertising. And if you'll read a book a month for six months, some of the best books on marketing, you'll know just about everything you need to know. You really will. You don't have to go to college to learn about marketing and advertising. But you have to be really good at it, and you have to understand it. And I think it's one of the most important functions in a business. You have to learn to be collaborative. That's very hard for entrepreneurs to do, because we tend to think we know everything. And I know when I went to work for Ford Motor Company, I thought I was the smartest guy. And by, I guarantee when they got around the table to talk to me, I didn't even want to talk. I just felt stupid. There were a lot of smart people at Ford Motor Company. My friends always said 
that I threw a hundred ideas against the wall every year and only three of them stuck, but boy, they were humdingers. But we were changing fast and going fast and with lots of new ideas. And every Christmas, I would go away for one week and read as many books as I could and come back. And Lordy mercy, you knew, you knew when I came back the first week of January. First, the last year was over. And if you weren't adding value to the business, you were gone. Because there was no reason to talk about last year. This is this year. And I want this year to be better than last year. I always had a big list of initiatives, a big list of new ideas, a big list of things to do. And the people that weren't cutting it were gone. Wouldn't, let, wouldn't fire them before Christmas, but I'd fire them after Christmas. Surely everybody here is getting monthly financial statements. I'm always amazed when I speak and people are not getting them. You have to work on the big problems, not everything. In 1990, I was carrying a pocket Rolodex. It was the predecessor of a, of a trio smartphone, if you will. And later in life when I had 3,000 contacts, but everybody laughed, because if, if, if you were my friend, or I knew you as a business acquaintance, and you had a lake house, I had the number of the lake house. And I knew how to reach you. And people would say, Sturgeon, give us that guy's number. We know you got it. I, I kept, I was militant. Even today, I won't put you in my contacts. If you give me your phone number, I'm going to call you and ask you your address. Because I will not put you in my contacts without an address. And I'm going to put a category on you. And I'm sorry? Well, business or uh, no, no, <laughs> financial prospect, you know, things like that. But I've got thousands and thousands, and, and it's really helpful. Like, if you want to send a press release, you talk about leverage, send a press release to everybody in your contact list. Because they'll tell somebody. And I'm always amazed because most people just, they're real lapsadaisical about the way they keep their contacts. Mail out Christmas party invitations. And it's a big job to round up everybody's address that you put in in the last year that you didn't put their address in. What do you, what do you keep them in? Uh, I have an iPhone. Okay. iPhone today, an Outlook. Understand your customer and your core competency. And most businesses just don't take enough time to understand their customer. You have to learn to delegate. This is so, so big. It kind of comes back to that mediocrity thing. You've just got to delegate. And without it, you're just not going to get where you need to be. You, and you have to, you have to make your money on the backs of other people. And I don't mean that in a mean way. It's just that you can't do everything. So you've got to find other people that will, that, that want to make you look good and that want to do things for you. And then operating metrics. I'm going to talk a little more about the metrics. Why do we need metrics? To compare our results with, uh, with results with others in the industry, also called KPIs. I'm sure you probably have a speaker about metrics. I have a lot of presentations on that, and I owe most of my success to peer benchmarking. I give classes in peer benchmarking within some industries. You need a sheet that has 25 metrics on it. How many invoices did we write last month? Everything you measure in your business. What were your labor costs as a percentage to your sales? How many employees did you have? Count full-time equivalents. They're, they're, the metrics are, a lot of them are similar for businesses, and you have some of your own. Material cost. Uh, uh, big expenses as a percentage of sales. Fixed. Variable expenses. You don't need too many. And everybody here almost everybody probably hates metrics. I know when I talk to owners, because they're like really boring, and they're especially a lot of trouble to gather. On the fifth of every month on my desk is the sheet with all the metrics. The accounting department populated it and laid it on my desk. And I guarantee you, wherever I shine my flashlight on that list, why did labor cost as a percentage of sales go up? We'll get a focus this month, and we'll get something fixed. But if you wait to gather the metrics yourself because you're bored and you hate it and it's tedious, you won't do it. So make somebody else do it and lay it on your desk. To benchmark against yourself, because every month you want to know, are, are you getting better or are you not? To trace cause and effect. Wow, there's a really powerful one. If you had some kind of new campaign or you did something new in productivity, can you see it in the metrics? Does it fall out of the metrics? To monitor for problems and how do you know what to improve? Why are some doing so well while others struggle? You know, I talked about this a little in the banker presentation because there's a guy right in front of you talking to the banker that's talking about how bad the weather is, and he needs a loan. 
and somebody just left in the same business. I like to use a restaurant as an example because we all know a restaurant that's doing really, really well, or a number of them, and a number of others that can't get out of their own way. They're really in trouble. And they're just, people just won't change. It creates impediments to sales and increases in expenses. What I find in most businesses that I consult for is they just have too many employees. And I'm just listening to the radio coming over here about all this sequestration crap. Why can't the government be just a little more efficient? I'm listening to this 5% thing and, and this lady's like hyperventilating because she's gonna have 5% less money. Who here didn't have to cut their expenses 5% in the last year? You didn't even think twice about it. You just did it. And you figured out how to way to do a, a way to do more with 5% less. And I, I just don't understand why why our government and, and companies can't get it. 50% of my assignments end up being about succession. Dads and sons that can't get along and, and families that can't get along and people can't figure out how to how to break the the the, the problem that they have. Failure to understand the financials. Hopefully not in this group. Failure to recognize the skills you don't have. You have to know, because if you hate math, you're not going to do it. Don't be trying to keep books or even have very much to do with books. You say, well, I can't hire somebody. You've got to hire the right person, and they will pay for themselves. I have a new book coming out, first part of next year, because I've just started it. I'm co-authoring it with the with my ex-partner from the Ford subsidiary. He was in charge of global operations for Ford Motor Company, and it's called, But You Don't Understand. That's the title. The subtitle is, My Business is Different. And time and time again, the problems are always the same. They are always the same. Too many employees, lack of change, failure to recognize weaknesses, so on and so on. We talked a little about marketing. I'm always amazed at the people that don't have their customer list or don't use it. They send statements every month, but they don't put, a, they don't put an offer in there. They don't put anything that reminds that Why wouldn't I put something in my statement that I send you every month that tells you why you should come see me or some special that I have this month or what makes my company better than the other companies you're also getting statements from? Become a leader, not a boss. This is hard for entrepreneurs because we tend to be type A bosses. But you have to learn how to be a more effective leader. You have to do strategic planning, and I've got some slides on that, and failure to improve. Reading and reading will help you a lot with the improvements. Expanding our customer base, effective use of the web and other technologies. If you have inventories that have to be online, and you have to have your SEO in place, which is search engine optimization. Now, I don't know how many people here use the web, but I typically find that people say, oh, it's not working like we thought it would, or it's not, work, not really for me. We tried it. Very few people have made the proper investment and spent the time to make the web work properly. And they think that because they've talked to their webmaster and he's told them this and told them that, that they're on the right track. But they're failing to get help because webmasters very, very seldom can connect your business proposition to the needs of the web. They think, well, they're right brain thinkers. Does everybody know what a right brain thinker is? Websites have to be optimized, and you have to understand enough about it to at least be able to talk about it. So go read SEO for Dummies. It's really good. It's really beneficial. It'll tell you the big blocks of work that you need to understand. You have to be able to articulate your unique selling proposition. There's a lot of businesses that think, well, our quality is higher. Really? It sounds like rhetoric to me. It sounds like a word track. What makes your quality higher? Can you write it down on a piece of paper? Tell me what makes your quality better than your competitors. Are people, oh, come on, that's bullshit. Come on, I want a better reason for why your product is better than everybody else's. What makes your selling proposition, what makes your value proposition better? The internet is dramatically underutilized. One of my favorite sayings, you don't know what you don't know. You should be monitoring web trends, term penetration. You should, if your term is, is uh, office equipment sales, where do you rank for office equipment sales? Do you know? 
And how many terms are you tracking? Somebody should be, your webmaster should be giving you a report every month that tells you in every search engine which terms, you, where you track for those terms. And then your marketing plans and your search engine optimization and your blog posting and, and your press releases and everything else you do needs to be revolved around using those terms more effectively. Traffic, organic, and direct. Some of you just use a website because you want customers to know about you. You want them to come and look at your product and understand it. Most of you use a website because you want customers to find you, which is a lot different type of traffic. That's the organic traffic, and it's the hardest to get. Conversions and abandonment. A conversion is somebody that comes to your website and then goes to another page within your website. Abandonment means they left the page. All these things are measured by Google and the other search engines as well and online management tools. But Google will give you a free report that will tell you. Goals, you can set goals. How many people actually went through your, came through your site, came through there, and then sent an email inquiring about something. Set a goal. And you can make changes on the site and then measure cause and effect. I cannot emphasize enough that owners are almost always in the dark, and you almost kind of should be because you don't need to be an expert, but you need to know enough to ask the right questions. And once you start looking at the reports and the metrics, then you can measure. Hold your webmaster accountable. Is your traffic going up every single month? Are you getting more orders? Are you getting more emails? I'm a landlord. We have a million square feet of office warehouse. I'm like a rounding error in Tarrant County. I'm the best kept secret. Look up any term you want. I'm on page one Google. I told you I met a lot of smart people and I learned bottom-up budgeting. Who knows what bottom-up budgeting means? Bottom-up budgeting means that if we make widgets and, we, and it takes 15 people to make 10,000 widgets, 